Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Are all extremely welcome to tonight, and it's so good to see so many of you here. And uh, hopefully, we'll be joined by a few more people. But so, on behalf of Ashray London and South East Chapter, you are all extremely welcome. Um, I just obviously just take a minute and just acknowledge the person near to you or uh, about you. Just give them a nod or a hello, like you know. It's, it's, uh, just, just, just great. Right. Shake, shake the hands. Wonderful. So um, we're here tonight um, to uh, to welcome our ASHRAE president, Mr. Mick Schwedler. We're absolutely delighted to be here, and our thanks to um, London South Bank University um, for hosting this uh, occasion and. Uh, we, um, we hopefully uh, you're going to enjoy the, uh, the talks, and then afterwards um, we'll uh, we'll meet for refreshments uh, upstairs. So, <laughs> so that, that's wonderful. So Mick Mick's talk is entitled "Feeding Your Roots." So there'll be a section in there well where you'll be invited to think about the person or the persons who fed your own roots. Was it a parent or a sibling, um, a family friend, a school teacher, someone at college? Was it your first boss or somebody you worked with along the way? For, for me, there's been been a number of people that fed my roots, so, so we, uh, we we think about them. Um, on the subject of um, feeding the roots, I just had a meeting earlier on with the uh, CEO of the Electrical Industries Charity. And a very upsetting statistic uh, was discussed that in the electric, uh, electrical industry last year, 42 people took their own lives. A further 14 young people, young apprentices, committed suicide. That's, that's really, really upsetting. And, you know, um, something as an industry we need to recognise and address. So, anyway, so without further ado, I'd just like to hand over to the Dean who's hosting us, um, Professor George Afari, and uh, he, he's got some uh, some words of uh, well. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. As a sign of respect, I've written a speech. But because um, I've been asked to, re to remind myself about who fed my roots, I want to remember my grandmother. Uh, I call her the first soul NGO. She adopted a village and she looked at her, after a whole village. I remember my two PhD supervisors, Professor John Andrews and Dr. Pat Hillebrand. They both became also the godparents of my first child. They fed my roots. They taught me everything I know while I stand here. Later on, perhaps we can share who fed our roots, but let me uh, read a speech that I've written. Distinguished guests, Mr. Mick Schwedler, President of the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, popularly known as ASHRAE, Mr. Patrick Prendergast, President of Ashray London and Southeast Chapter, members of the organizing committee of this event, the executive committee of, um, of the chapter, other members of Ashray, my colleagues from the various schools in LSBU, and all who are here present. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is George Ofori, and I'm the Dean of the School of the Built Environment and Architecture at the London South Bank University. I'm glad that I've been asked to say a few words before I officially open this event, which is entitled Ashray Presidential Address, Personal Growth, Global Impact, Feed the Roots. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here to this event, which we are very proud to host at LSBU. I'm happy that the Ashray UK, London and Southeast chapter, entrusted us with the organization of this event. 
in relation to the visit of the president. Um, I could go on and say that I've known Ashray since I was young, but um, I won't. So, so let me go on and read the speech because otherwise it will take too long. A quick word about this event, um, just to give you an idea of what we are here for. So after me, you will hear the Ashray president speak. I know from the program that you will also have the opportunity to ask questions. Normally you don't, but you have you have an opportunity to ask questions. I don't know whether the program has changed, but you can ask uh, Mr. Schrodler questions. It, to me, it's a privilege to have that opportunity. Then there will be a short presentation on a groundbreaking, we, we, we say that it's a groundbreaking pilot program with a series of short courses on um, zero carbon buildings, which my colleague um, Aaron Gillich will present. And we developed this in response to uh, market needs and also with funding from the Office of Students. Uh, we say we're doing this to develop the new generation of, um, of people who will be uh, designing and helping our transition towards net zero. <laughs> After that, there will be a presentation on a book by the vice president of, um, of the London chapter. And after that, there will be more opportunities for questions and answers. Following that, uh, I've been told that there will also be the opportunity to network because there will be finger food and drinks. I think I'll be failing my duty as dean if I don't tell you about our school um, and what we do in building services engineering. Education and research in building services engineering at LSBU has very, a very, very long history. And uh, this year, we shall be celebrating the 75th anniversary of educating um, people here in building services engineering. The National College for Heating, Ventilation, Air Conditioning and Refrigeration was set up at the then uh, Borough Polytechnic 75 years ago. We have educated, we like to say that we have educated about 60% of all the building services engineers in the UK. And this small university has educated about 60% of all building services engineers in the UK. I like to say this and tell, and tell people about this anecdote. I will be here a little bit longer, but only about 10 seconds more. So one day I was visited, my, my own area of expertise in, in construction, money, uh, construction industry development. So a delegation from Hong Kong came to visit. And among the delegation was one who was an official member of the delegation. He was the president of the, uh, um, I think the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers in Hong Kong. He said he was educated here. Now, beside him, he wasn't an official member of, of, the, um, of the delegation. He was the former president of the institution in Hong Kong, also educated here. And I couldn't be prouder. So this is what we do at LSBU when it comes to building services engineering. We educate the leaders. In 2019, we were given the Hufford Brilliant Award for the quality of building services engineering education in our school. And also because we have strong links to industry and the support we provide to our students was just to be first class. And we, they also said that um, the quality of our graduates in building services engineering is extremely high. Since 1947, many of the um, innovations in technology in the sector of the built environment that relate to building services engineering have actually originated here. Uh, we like to say that we've pioneered many, many uh, research and enterprise activities which relate to sustainability. And uh, the research we've done here relates to something called the um, Building Energy Network, or we like to call it BEN. Um, I, I don't want to mention the person who, who led the design of it, but later on perhaps he, he will identify himself. It links two buildings on this campus. We say charity begins at home, so we, um, if you like, um, Perhaps the best known of our work in building services engineering is here at home. Okay. Uh, the Ben network is visited from time to time by some designers and also some of the local authorities are very much interested in what we're doing. In future, we will be going into two areas or, or many more areas, but let me highlight two. One of them is um, looking at hydrogen as an energy source, and the other one is in the area of retrofitting. And so the, the, you know, the, the, the talk um, that Aaron will be giving later on is about this. But the work that we've done has been partly and um, quite strongly also enabled by our relationships to the professional institutions that we've, we've, um, we've been um, involved with. 
and now links to uh, CIFSI goes back to the mid 1940s. CIFSI is the Chartered Institute of Building Services and Engineering, goes back to the uh, 1940s, and we we have actually have very strong links to CIFSI. We want, also want to develop similar links to ASHRAE. So we did our homework, and we found that ASHRAE was actually founded in 1894. It's, we we found that it's also a global society which uh, is involved in advancing uh, human well-being through sustainable technology for the built environment. Actually, it um, focuses on building systems, energy efficiency, indoor air quality, and sustainability. These are areas that we also work in. And we also learned a little bit about the ASHRAE UK, London and Southeast chapter. We found that it works with industry and academic partners to facilitate knowledge transfer. And its objectives are scientific and educational, and they include advancement of sciences of heating, refrigeration, and air conditioning engineering. And then the other, yeah, the other aspects of science in these particular areas. They are also very much interested in continuing education and the development of their members um, and other people who are interested in science and engineering relating to um, building services. These objectives, these objectives are very similar to what we have, and therefore we are very keen to engage with Ashre, not only for this particular event, but very much long into the future. So we welcome the president, and we um, are very pleased that you know we were selected to be the host, because there are other schools, other universities in, in London. Um, we're grateful that we have this opportunity. So I want to finish by thanking the president for. Uh, uh, visiting us here, and I'm looking forward to the talk that he'll be giving. And I thank you for also coming, and I thank the chapter for choosing us in the end. So I've been asked to hand you over to the president of Ashri, Mr. Lee. Our journey continues. We'll see that since our society's inception, we've had three sets of roots that lead to our personal growth and our global impact. We'll also understand the importance for each of us to feed the roots <coughs> and to pay it forward for our future generations. Ashley's heritage, our roots begins, as the Dean said in 1894, with the founding of the American Society of Heating and ventilating engineers. Our founding member, Harry Crane, put into words reasons for founding our society. We wanted to form personal and professional relationships, learn from one another, and consult and network with one another. These led to our personal growth and what we refer to as our member-to-member -member connections. And now fast forward to 1906. When our Illinois members requested permission to form a chapter and were granted that permission. This became what's known as our grassroots, which is an ASHRAE hallmark. We 
grow from our grassroots, our chapters. And today we're 199 chapters worldwide with the most recent being in Peru, Libya, and now Alexandria, Egypt. So that's our second set of roots, our grassroots. Our third set of roots is really with our deep technical roots. This took place in 1917 when the two people here, F. Paul Anderson and Margaret Ingalls, worked with our research bureau. And since then, we've funded our own research to the tune of $2.3 million during a global pandemic. And by funding our own research, we don't have to get to the answer that the sponsor wants us to get to. We get to research that is objective and it can be trusted. So we have our three sets of roots, our personal roots, our grassroots, and our technical roots. And since 1959, more than $78 million has been donated. So we started out in 1906 at our convention where, frankly, everyone kind of looked like me, but some of them have hair. <laughs> and we've changed today for women, men, vintage, young, global culture. So in addition to our traditional membership, we are investing in women in ASHRAE, young engineers in ASHRAE. We're reaching out to communities that are presently underserved because to move forward into the future, we need those smart, hardworking, and diverse professionals to move on and lead us into the next generation. Because it's not one group or the other, it's all of us together that make ASHRAE and our entire industry extraordinary. And we have a goal to serve humanity. Let's look at a few of the ways we've served humanity lately. First, ASHRAE's educational, technical, and training materials is well known and respected worldwide, and it's available to all of our members on our technology portal. Next, we have young engineers in ASHRAE, which are those 35 years of age and, and younger. They started as a vision of many. But the important part is not that we have Yay members, young engineers in ASHRAE, but the people who were started in Yay are now leading us into the future to serve our future generations. And our most recent impact in the last two and a half years, our epidemic task force. Through the global efforts of more than 150 volunteer members, and those include SIPSI volunteers working with us volunteers from other associations throughout the world, ASHRAE worked to put together information that was available to everybody for free on the internet before some of the World Health Organization or in the US, our Center for Disease Control could make decisions. The Epidemic Task Force came to the board of directors and said, we want ASHRAE to issue a statement that says, COVID is likely enough to be spread by aerosol that we need to treat it that way. Our board of directors listened to our technical members and issued that statement. Now, the other, those, those larger groups, they have to jump through more hoops. But we have seen that it is transmitted by aerosol and it's a good thing that our industry started treating it that way early on. So it didn't last even longer. Through that, ASHRAE, ventilation and filtration are not talked about in global media throughout the world in day-to-day -day life. And here's how it happened. Our epidemic task force put the information on the internet. People like you, designers, professors, construction folks, you took that information and you grew personally. I didn't know. I'm not an airside expert. But now I know more about ventilation and filtration than I ever had, had in my life. We grew personally. We and the people in this room then took that information to the other people who needed it, the building owners and operators, the school boards, the administrators who needed this information to learn how can they safely get people back in the buildings. Two of our chapters in Michigan took the information and put together a joint task force. And that task force went out and educated nonprofits, schools, and healthcare facilities to get them the information. So we started with our personal learning, our technical information. We learned personally, 
and then you, our grassroots, whether you're an ASHRAE member or not, took that to the people who needed it to reduce that impact. And then some other things happened. I like Jen in the back left of the auditorium. She has an ASHRAE magnet on the back of her van. Her college roommate today works for the La Crosse County Health Department. That's in the USA in Wisconsin. She was talking with Paula, her roommate, and her roommate turned to her and said, Ashray, we use their information. I never thought I would hear that in my life. And then I was in our Detroit, Michigan chapter talking to parents of children in the schools. They shared that the school's teachers are now telling other, te other parents about ventilation infiltration, and that is impact, an impact on the world. I shared last June during our virtual conference that I had a chance to volunteer with Heather Shopline, who's on the right here. She chaired a regional conference in San Diego, California that I had a chance to visit. I hadn't worked with her before. And what I saw was a vibrant and extraordinary volunteer who delivered an amazing chapters regional conference for our region 10 and our region nine. Her husband, David, is on the left. The night before the conference, I learned they were expecting their first child. And Heather fed my roots during the conference by watching how hard she worked, how she served the members. Little did we know that the next time we would see each other would be about a year later, during the Region 10 virtual chapters regional conference. <laughs> and nine month old Cohen was with her. Serving our mission to serve humanity through the arts and sciences of heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration. We serve not only our generations, but our future generations. And here are some of the ways that we do that. So we've had our chapters get together. We've gotten together, but during the pandemic, that was paused. But what we found is rather than just accept going back to normal, they wanted to instead move on to extraordinary. So it started out with virtual visits the last year. Many chapters meeting virtually. We went to our regional conferences. We started to get back together in person. Isn't it wonderful to be here tonight in person talking with one another without masks unless we want or need them. And I was wearing some on the tube on the way here today because we want to have that, that empathy for the people who are still dealing with the effects of the pandemic. But we've also moved on to extraordinary. In, in the meantime, not only have our grassroots done that, but our technology, our research, our standards have all continued. We are also reaching out to global associations. ASHRAE is what's called the Distinguished Lecturer Program. And they identify about 75 experts in the field who are made available to our chapters and the society pays for the lecturer's flight to the chapter. So if you wanna talk, talk on indoor environmental quality, Chandra Sakar from Singapore can be flown here at ASHRAE's expense. And then the chapter just has to pick up hotel and meals while they're here, because we want to make sure as a society, we are feeding the roots in that way. We have a diversity, equity and inclusion subcommittee. This is the first board of directors subcommittee I've ever seen or known about, because we do have underserved communities. We want to make sure that those folks know about our industry and not that they have to become ASHRAE members but that those smart, hardworking people come into our industry. We need workers and we need great thinkers and we want them to come from all backgrounds because that makes us more diverse and it makes it more, us more extraordinary. We partnered with a lot of organizations and our board members have met with a number of these organizations. I had a chance this morning and this, this afternoon to meet with the SIBC president, Kevin Mitchell, and CEO Ruth Carter, thank you so much for your hospitality. We have a great relationship of collaboration. We want to move on in the future 
together and continue to collaborate even more. And that's why we're meeting with people from all around the world. One organization can't do it all. We need to work together to have that continued global impact. For the first time, Ashray was invited to the Conference of Parties and our treasurer, Ginger Scoggins, who has now been nominated to be president-elect, attended COP26 in Glasgow, and she delivered a presentation on decarbonization that's available on the ASHRAE website. What a fantastic new person moving forward. Next. Two years ago, the world paused. We weren't able to have meetings. In September of 2021, our ASHRAE Monterey, Mexico members worked with AHR Mexico to the visit to deliver our first in-person conference in 20 months. And we learned it could be done. We learned it could be done safely by having safeguards in place. So I want to celebrate our Ashley Monterey volunteers for them moving forward and showing us how we can do similar things. We had our conference in January for the first time in two years in Las Vegas. We were masked. We practiced social distancing. In addition, the group that takes care of our conferences sent out a COVID test kit to everybody who had registered and asked everybody to take the test before getting on the plane to come out. Again, for people's safety. When it came to our house, Jen said, are you gonna take it? President's supposed to be at the conference. I said, we have to. I have friends from our local chapter too who tested positive and didn't know it. So this allowed people to be safe. And we had a great conference together and we look forward to more in the future. From the next standpoint, where are we moving forward? We are uh, President Chuck Gullish, put together a task force on building decarbonization. In this year's president-elect Farouk Mabub, a consulting engineer in Pakistan, has reorganized that to make it a little bit more strategic, but we're trying to follow the same model of our epidemic task force. Let's reach out and get the information out. The, the task force for building decarbonization is also sponsoring a decarbonization conference in Athens, Greece in October. So there's information available on that. People from all of, over the world are coming and presenting. We also had a Vision 2030 committee. Sometimes at ASHRAE, reports are made by groups and they get put on a shelf and nothing happens with them. What we're trying to do is make sure we're using the brain power that we have and we're working those in, the recommendations from Vision 2030 into our future visions and we're laying the infrastructure out so that we can move forward to 2030 and beyond. Some of our initiatives this year have been a challenge. Uh, this is a picture of me being great, kicking and screaming into Jen and my wedding in 1984. And just for the record, it is staged. <laughs> but this is how I felt about social media. I didn't get it. I didn't grow up with it. It wasn't in my DNA. But I realized that this is the way our younger professionals in the industry come in and begin to communicate. So we don't need to make them transfer to how we work. We can go both ways. I'm now on Instagram. I know LinkedIn doesn't count as social media, but for my vintage, it does. And we're on Facebook. So we want to make sure we're reaching out to people the way they want to communicate. In addition, Ashley had a lot of educational materials, but they were really hard to find on our website. So we worked with our, our staff to put together what are called learning pathways. That is, as a young professional in the industry, how do you start and take the information and move on and grow and learn personally? So we put together the first HVAC design basics. And you go there, here's a path laid out. How do you take the next steps? The second one, pathogen mitigation. 
we need to learn, keep the lessons of the last two and a half years. Make sure we continue that education and moving forward because we are going to have future, future health issues. There are a couple learning pathways that are going to be developed based on what people around the world want to learn about. The other thing we put together was we, we termed them member to member connections. These were 12 to 15 minute videos put together with our members where I do a, a virtual interview with them. They're posted on the Ashford presidential website. Okay. One of the things I'd like to share, so, so these were the first half of uh, the last half of 2021. In January, I did a solo. And I learned in March of 2020 that working in the basement when it's dark in winter in Wisconsin isn't conducive to mental health <laughs> or good mental health. So every day I put on my calendar to take my mental health walk to help me, but also to help us help others. Because what we found is that, as Patrick was saying, people have been affected differently by the pandemic. We were affected at different times, in different ways. This is my, I'm, I'll be 64 years old. This is the first crisis my generation has experienced. And as I shared earlier today, I don't think we handled it well. We didn't lead as we could have. We fractionated instead of coming together. So what we want you to, everybody to know about is as you come out of the pandemic, you're not alone. If you need help, ask. If you see somebody or who needs help or maybe you haven't seen someone in a while, reach out to them and ask because we need to have everybody and it's, it's not just a group, it's not just an organization, but it's a worldwide community that we need to make sure we reach out to. President Chuck Gulledge last year visited 150, he had 157 different chapter events. Only three were in person. What perseverance, what strength he took to deliver 154 virtual events during his presidential year. So one of the ways we wanted to connect with members this year was to visit as many chapters and groups as we could. So we reached out to our directors and regional chairs. This chapter is in region 14. Patrick is the president. We reached out and said, can we schedule at least a week in each of our regions to get out and meet with our members, find out what do you need? How do we help serve you in the local community? How do we work with the local organizations? They put together a way that we could get out to all 15 of our regions throughout the world. Two of them had to go virtual due to COVID. Our region at large, would go, which goes from Africa to the Middle East and over to, to India. And then our region 13, the lower right, because there were still requirements to quarantine when we wanted <clears throat> to enter the country. So we did those instead virtually. And that worked also. So to date, we have visited chapter number 87 with the London and Southeast chapter, more than 5,000 members and guests, and about another thousand what I term as members to be. Now, as if I've gotten to get out, I've realized that Atrey's mission and vision are spot on. but I had a, an educational moment. I was talking with students from the University of Miami, Miami University, and I was asked to inspire them. So I'm orating. And then I said some bad words. I said HVAC, BTUs. And I saw it in their eyes. They said, no thanks. I want to have an impact. And I realized we often use the wrong language. So after seeing the looks on their faces, 
I changed what I said. And I said, we make buildings sustainable and resilient. We reduce the energy utilization intensity and environmental emissions. Our industry, the cold chain, mitigated a global pandemic by keeping the vaccines cold. We reduce food spoilage. 40% of the world's food spoils between the field and our forks. We reduce that. Most importantly, we keep people safe and healthy in the built environment. When I changed the words that day, their eyes lit up and they said, I want to be part of this industry. As we can have an impact together. And the fact is nothing happens without volunteers, no matter what organization you take part in. And our volunteers are extraordinary throughout the world. In June of last year, I did ask, who fed your roots? And these are the types of answers we got back to. The other question I asked is, whose roots will you feed? And the people not only talked about feeding the roots, but they went out and did it. Money Kana is our chapter technology transfer chair in one of our newer chapters in Chandigarh, India. During the last site year, during a pandemic, he and his team put together 43 events. They had each up, President Gullage online for three of them. After I, when I went to a Chandigarh chapter virtual presentation after Chuck, they said, Chuck was here. Not Chuck was here virtually. Chuck was here because that was Chuck there. This year through November, they put together a 12 session webinar, two webinar, a 12 session training se session, two webinars. And then the first time they could get together, did they train on technical things? They refreshed their member to member connections. They networked with one another as we'll be doing in a few minutes. I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, where our founding member who talked about our member, member connections was. The Cincinnati chapter interviewed their past chapter presidents and made those available to the new members so that new members could connect with the former leaders of that chapter. And SIPSI and Ashray Ireland worked together to put together a mentoring program. And not only did they put together the mentoring program, but they also want to feed the roots and pay it forward for the next generations because they are taking one of the people being mentored and sending them to the Astral annual, annual Conference in Toronto. So they're not only talking, they're putting the money to help move things forward. When I went to our chapter's regional conferences, I asked every time I was there, Whose roots will you feed? I've been to chapters throughout the world. I ask the same questions. Whose roots will you feed in the next three months? Richard, I'm asking you the question. Please take 15 seconds to put together two or three names. Whose roots will you feed in the next three months? It's somebody you already know, you already admire them, you want to help them grow. And it's not just vintage people mentoring young folks. Lucy, you know ways to communicate that people my vintage don't. Mentorship goes both ways. And now that you've made your personal list, reach out. Each time you do, you take us back to Harry Crane's vision for Ashby 127 years ago. And Ash Ray, as we move on to, to extraordinary. And then, if you feel like it, maybe share your Feed the Roots moments on social media to create that tidal wave. So, we've come full circle. Guided by our mission, we get to serve humanity every day. We started out with Heather and David in 2019, of Cohen in 2020. And in December of 2021, I got to meet Ainsley. 
and guided by our industry, guided by our mission, we get to serve humanity every day. That's an honor, it's a privilege. We each volunteer in different ways. We serve in our chosen manner. We do it because we grow personally and professionally and we help others do the same. We do it because we have a collective global impact <clears throat> that affects our personal and future generations. And we do it because we have our roots, our personal roots, our grassroots, and our technical roots that allow us to serve humanity. Ladies, gentlemen, the roots. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being here. It was only about two weeks ago that uh, I had the first client chance to travel outside of North America to visit chapters because of the way the pandemic had affected travel. Um, the collaboration that we have with SIPSI has been strong. We saw with our Ireland chapter what's being done, and we had a great meeting today. Because it, we aren't we aren't warring associations. We're people who want to have that global and collective impact. So thank you to the folks from SIBSI. If you don't know her, Lucy Sherburn is a the present SIBSI graduate of the year. So how about a hand for her? things about being asked for president is you get to put together a presidential gift to remind people of, of the society theme. It's personal growth, global impact, but really Feed the Roots has resonated with our membership and Kevin's theme for SIPSI this year is paying it forward. So we are we are right on track. But for, for Feed the Roots, my wife Jen found two local artists husband and wife art teachers, and they put together towels with wood gut designs on them. And this is the, the shape of the state of Wisconsin in the US, but it's in the form of tree branches. So it reminds you to feed the roots. But they didn't stop there. They used the proceeds from selling the towels to buy art supplies for their students who can't afford them. So they are feeding the roots. Uh, Northern Wisconsin has a, a lot of forest, and we we know a, a woods craftsperson, and he put together some Ashford branded coasters with maple, cherry, walnut, and now butternut. And we'd like to present this to one of our mentors here and hope this helps Patrick to continue to remember to feed the roots. Patrick, if you will. Thank you. Anything is fair game, please. Yes. Thank you very much. I do. And a lot were in tech, but I totally picked out uh, your comment about that we didn't lead as well as we could have. And I, I think you're referring to the time during the pandemic. And I don't know if you're referring to our generation or the generation or the industry. I was referring to the generation. Um, we, we fractionated as a world. Instead of working together, we took sides instead of trying to concentrate on the issue. I think our industry <clears throat> led the world out of the global pandemic. We wouldn't be here today without, without what you have done. Our industry has been, never been more relevant. We've never been more essential. I, I started in, in the industry in 1982. 
I've never been prouder to be in this industry. So it was my generation, not our industry. Thank you so much for asking. Please. Uh, Issa Shonai of Golden South Bank University, and thank you for uh, a very uh, useful and helpful uh, presentation. Uh, research innovation is very, very important, especially at this time of year where we're transitioning towards next year. And I see a lot of eagerness in the industry to support students to in the education uh, pathway. However, the element of sponsoring students in the, their research and journey is something that is very, very important. I saw the figure that you've mentioned in point three million uh, dollars. I think. Yes. How much do you, as a, an institute and other institutes in here, support research students in their research journey, PhD or father postgraduate education? Sure. Uh, so for people who are online, who may not have heard it, the question is, uh, how how much do does the industry support research students? And I'll say that there are three different ways. Uh, the first is we directly sponsor research. And the $2.3 million, that's what was raised by our, our local members. We match that with up to $2 million additional from other revenues that we have. So the, the first direct way is, that is available to research that is uh, comes up through the ASHRAE research path, and then anybody in the world can bid on that research. And frankly, a lot of times universities get that because um, most graduate students, when I was a grad student, I was a lower pay grade than some people who were in the industry working already. So uh, partially it's that. The second thing is ASHRAE funds, um, grants in kind and we will if there's something that is needed at a particular school or university that is another funding availability to the universities and to the students at the, those universities so in addition to the research we also have a, a lot of scholarships some are undergrad some are uh, students just entering college there are fewer for graduate students but out on, on the ASHRAE website, you only have to apply once. And then the ASHRAE process figures out what are you eligible for? And if you're eligible for more than one and win more than one, you get the highest monetary award. So we, we understand the importance of students. Um, if you think of it for, in the US, the students are today for us high school seniors. <clears throat> You'll be working with in five years. Don't we want to have those great people educated and ready to help us? And the people who go into graduate school and, and beyond that, it might be eight or 10 years, but we want them as part of the industry. Thank you. One, two more? Yes, okay, Andy please. Andy Ford from Saffron University. Um, you speak incredibly well, really, really good. Thank you. And I was very struck by your comments about Hawaii and uh, using the different language. And it strikes me as one of the things that we don't do very well with engineering generally is communicate. But I wondered if there was uh, something that we could somehow collaborate on around that. Great question about the, the communication. I decided at that point I've been in the HVAC industry for almost 40 years. That's not what I work in anymore. Now when people ask me when I come through the border guards, I say I'm with an association that has chapters. We work with sustainable and resilient buildings and we re help reduce the, our environmental emissions. So I think a lot of times it's more, we, we should talk about what we do and the impact we have rather than how we do it. The how we do it, we need to get to the right people who have the, the want to learn the tech, technical side. But today's students, much like I, I graduated from high school in 1976, we wanted to change the world, didn't we? 
they still do. And with the with the way communications are on the Internet is they see different ways that they can change the world. And when we show them they can change the world with us also as an industry, they want to be part of it. There are a lot of. There are a lot of commitments being made to decarbonize. Who's going to make those commitments a reality? So people in this room. People are writing checks that we will be cashing because. What happens at the building is what we do. We so I, I think as we talk more about that and in ways that people can relate to. We'll we'll see that groundswell of folks coming into our industry. Thank you very much for your kind comments, sir. Good. We'll be around through the social. Yes, uh, wonderful. Thank you, Nick. Looks like you've now give the floor to Professor Aaron Gillings. He'll be telling us about some exciting new courses at South Tanker Run. Oh, it came up. There we go. Yeah, here's the thumb drive if you want to use it. I might use the buttons. I'll keep it simple. This is a little tricky, so yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank so you. much. Okay. Well, the talk won't be that quick. Sorry. Well, I'll go back to the beginning. There we go. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me to, me to speak. It really is a, a privilege to get to speak to this audience. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Aaron Gillick. I'm a professor of building decarbonization. I thought before I uh, tuck in, uh, in, in the spirit of discussing your roots, I should share a quick story of my own. So um, I got into engineering because of my grandfather. He was the first engineer that I ever knew. Um, and uh, I grew up in Canada. And in Canada, when you become an engineer, they give you an iron ring. So the, the, this ring here, it's the metal, the, the iron for the ring comes from a bridge that collapsed uh, around 70 or so years ago. And it symbolizes our kind of responsibility to, so to society and kind of remember the sort of spirit of what we take on as engineers uh, and to sort of carry that with us. And the, the ceremony when you graduate is that an ex a, a current engineer hands you your iron ring as you become an engineer. And so my grandpa passed me mine. Um, and then when he passed away a few years ago, um, he gave me his iron ring as a, as a it to me. So my iron rings at home in a drawer. I'll, I'll have to give it to someone else someday. And uh, and I continue to wear my grandpa's uh, ring. So I can I, I carry my roots with me and I'm very grateful for them. Um, so that the topic that I want to uh, cover here today is around accelerating net zero education. Um, I think we've already heard a, a, an introduction from George about the role that LSBU plays in the built environment. And I, and I think it's worth kind of Repeating and thinking about that, that, that over half of the built environment of the building services engineers in the country kind of go through these doors. They come from LSBU, right? Um, and we're all very, very strongly linked with industry, right? With with SIBSI and other industry bodies. The university has a very strong history of, 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 of its roots, both in applied research, how we develop our curriculum, and all that. So as we think about sort of net zero and the roles that we can all play in it. It's potentially very, very impactful the decisions that we make as individuals and how they kind of cascade onwards. Uh, and I think we're on the cusp of some very significant changes in our education system. And we have kind of both the responsibility and an opportunity to make the most of that. Now, if you've seen me do a talk anytime in the last couple of years, you've probably seen this slide already. And so I can only apologize, but you're going to see it again. I wish I could change this slide, but it stays relevant because the line stays the same. It just keeps going up and up and up. Um, the only thing that's changed is the headline, the title. I change the title every now and then as the tone of how this topic is reflected in the media changes, right? So a year or two ago, I used the phrase the decisive decade on climate action, right? That was referring to the 2020s. That phrase was in the news for a while. Then that became uh, code red around the middle of last year. Uh, and now they're just saying now or never. That's pretty much the only phrase that you see attached to the, 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 this kind of figure now. Now, I just think it's important to remember when we talk about net zero, it's a 2050 target, right? Everybody keeps saying net zero by 2050. 
But every single version that has us meeting that, every single version of this curve, the dotted line, has us doing at least half the work, hopefully well more than half the work by 2030, right? So a lot of us are probably already working on projects that are big projects that might even just start wrapping up by 2030. Certainly, 2030 is really not that far off. So it quite seriously is now or never. And as built environment professionals, we're in a position where every decision counts on every project. So why am I introducing this uh, uh, before I talk about education? Every single study that's been carried out on this says quite decisively that we have nowhere near the skills we need to deliver this. Uh, in the UK, I'm sure the trend is pretty much the same in, in just about every other country. Nowhere near. Um, they, this covers every single skill level from sort of uh, from, from trades, from sort of smaller activities, right up through every level of education. Right. So we have tremendous responsibilities as educators and sort of advocates for these issues in the built environment to up the rate of education of green skills and net zero skills in the built environment. So one of the documents um, that, that's come out recently uh, on this topic is the Construction Industry Council's uh, Climate Action Plan. Now, I'm just curious by show of hands, how many people have seen this and read this? Okay. Okay, still less than half. I keep, I've been asking this ever since this came out. This was my favorite document of last year. It's wonderful. So one of, one of the perks of being a professor is you get to hand out homework. If you haven't, if you haven't read this, you got to go home and read this. This is your homework, the assigned reading. Uh, and if you have read it, your homework is to give it to someone else uh, and make them read it. Uh, take a copy with you. I've been in quite a few meetings lately where I was with colleagues who hadn't heard this and the, the, the question comes up, well, what is sort of the built environment doing about this? How are we changing how, how the industry is going to respond to these things? You can slide this document across the table. It's wonderful. It goes through 10 different categories of actions, sets out sort of short, medium, long-term goals. I'm not going to go through all of them now. As I say, you'll, you'll, you'll do it in the assigned reading. Um, but one of them, one of the headline ones is uh, education, right? So what this basically is, is a a document that almost every single uh, professional institution in the UK has now signed up to. There's over 40 in total that have signed up to this, right? And so every uh, every signatory is now going to implement these changes throughout the, their basically how they train and educate their members, right? To maintain membership and for new members. So on the education theme, we here at LSBU now need to change quite decisively everything that we teach our built environment professionals. And remember, half the universe, half the uh, building services professionals in the UK are going to go through these changes now. So our next accreditation uh, cycle is next year, right? And I'm really looking forward to LSBU tucking into this as a, as a challenge and making it an exemplar of how we're going to sort of really transform built environment education in the UK. Uh, remember the, the timeline on the previous slide though, right? We have until 2030 to make some pretty decisive movements here. So even if we implement this now, we got a few years for kind of uh, that that to kick in with sort of existing students. Then they'll go graduate, maybe even towards the back half of this decade if they're part timers. We're looking at new professional institution members by the end of this decade. It's not nearly fast enough, right? So in order to respond to that curve, right, to, to the urgency required by this curve, we need something faster. As wonderful as this is, we need something faster. CPD is always going to be a very important component of this, right? It's going to be a very critical part of how we we, we deliver this plan. Uh, but we cannot underestimate the value of higher education in this process, the sort of the rigor and the depth and all the kind of uh, research links that you can bring to it through higher education. So quite conveniently, last year, the Department for Education announced this new plan to pilot short courses in higher education, right? So the idea would be that they are available through universities, sort of pulling from their existing programs, but improving them and off combining them in an offer that doesn't currently exist in anything that they do. And this is meant to expand access to uh, higher education for people sort of from all walks of life that they can dip into throughout their lives, sort of uh, with this new uh, sort of ongoing loan program that's available throughout their lives. So you would come, do it for a year, and then go back to work, right? LSBU was fortunate enough to be one of the uh, pilot programs chosen to do this. And we are now launching in the fall four short courses around the delivery of net zero. So like I said, they're one year, they're going to be uh, very rapid delivery, immersive alongside existing students, but taught in a way that's slightly different. The whole focus of this was to develop it really uh, in close association with industry. So we worked with two groups, one called the Climate Framework, which is a volunteer group that works across all the professional institutions, SIBSI among them. So the professional institutions were very closely involved in how we created this. 
Uh, and the other group that we worked with was Bizria, that represents uh, about a thousand or so uh, fairly large develop uh, sorry, um, large companies across the built environment, sort of from all branches of the built environment. So this was very much responding to urgent industry needs to say, after one year, what can you walk away with, take right back to your jobs that would have an impact right away? I'll run through very quickly the four that we came up with uh, that, that, that were designed. So the first one was designing net zero buildings. We've had a lot of feedback from people who are saying that there is now more demand for net zero buildings than they can actually meet with the, with, with the, the skills that they have in-house. It's actually hard to keep up with demand in some ways. A lot of companies, a lot of developers are trying to exceed the regulatory minimum. You're still not required to build net zero buildings, but a lot of people are trying to anyways and finding it hard to find the skills. It's actually harder than you think to completely phase out fossil fuels from your development. So that's what this course is responding to. The next one is operating net zero buildings. It's not enough just to design something that works on paper. You have to figure out a way to get it to work and continue to work throughout its lifetime, right? And so this one, we're aiming in particular at people who are perhaps coming from uh, a slightly different uh, background. Maybe they have a lot more practical education, but less formal education. Uh, and this would be a way of sort of firming up those credentials uh, in higher education. The third one is on procurement. We had a lot of feedback from local authority partners, people in housing associations and things like that, saying that the people who are in decision making roles, who are trying to write uh, 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 ITTs and things for large projects, actually find it very hard to go out and, and write a good brief that keeps developers on track and delivers sort of a whole life value in a way that, that, that is net zero compatible. So that's what this one is aiming at. And the last one, and this speaks to, to uh, the, the point that Andy and, and Mick were making about communication. I think it's one thing to go out and create a net zero building. It's another thing to go and lead and inspire a team that goes out and creates a bunch of net zero buildings, right? And we need more and more, I think, to inspire other leaders uh, among us and elevate them to decision-making roles so that they can take away a good technical idea and find a way to communicate that idea in a, in a manner that sort of catches on and, and, and builds on itself. So I'm very excited about this one as well, about the leadership and management in, in net zero buildings. So to wrap up, um, that CIC climate action plan is a very, very important document and I encourage everyone to read it. The only flaw that it has, I would say, is that because it had to fold in so many views from so many different um, portions of the built environment, is it had to be slightly vague in places, right? Uh, it couldn't put really firm timelines, and it's going to rely on, on us, basically, the members of all these professional institutions, to go out and really support it and engage with it and really take it from an idea to a reality, right? And it will be very easy for that to sort of slip back to incremental change. That would be a tremendous missed opportunity. We need to, we need to really support professional institutions in making that a transformational document that completely changes how the built environment addresses uh, net zero buildings. Uh, in that vein, if we're going to address all the skills gaps that we need to in time, I think there's a real place for this idea of higher education uh, at the at, at the fore, somewhere between CPD and a full degree program, something that we can develop and get out in the industry, uh, driving change quickly. Now, I, I've been saying I just became a SIBSI member a couple weeks ago. So uh, for the very first time, I got to attend an AGM uh, just, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I got to hear Kevin's uh, very good introductory uh, speech on inspiring the next generation, where he put this uh, th this up to close his speech on on the 125th anniversary, a set of challenges uh, to, to all of us, really, to the built environment. So I'm going to call upon my colleagues here at SBU uh, and, and everyone else in this room, really, uh, to to work with us in responding to these challenges. I think what better platform could we possibly ask for uh, to inspire the next generation and accelerate net zero education together. Thank you. I just say, if anyone has any questions about the net zero courses, Pip is right here. She knows everything. So come and ask Pip. Thank you. <laughs> I've got a one question, Pip. Oh, oh, didn't put me on the spot. When, like when can I sign up? <laughs> Sign up right now. That's right, brilliant. Right. That's brilliant. They're, we'll, they're ready to roll out. We're right? we're just at the, the, the getting them. Yeah, the, validated. They, they, yes, they're going. They've gone through a validation process. The website's going up. So yes, if you want to sign up, we're ready to take those. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they'll be launched in September of this year. So the first enrollment is September of this year. Okay, and they're, yeah. they're level somewhere between level four and six. Exactly. Yes, yeah. they're undergraduate level four to six. That's right.
So if you'll be available for questions Come afterwards. Me, yes. Good yeah. stuff. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yankovic, who's going to give us a, a, a short presentation on his um, his latest revision of his book. Yes. Thank you, Luca. Which uh, which computer <laughs> I need to get into? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mick. And um, um, thank you for um, uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk and, and the update. So this is about uh, design, designing zero carbon buildings. Well, um, and uh, my name is uh, uh, Professor Lubo Jankovic. I'm a research professor at the University of Hertfordshire and also uh, vice president of the uh, uh, Ashford London chapter. Um, in 2017, I published the second edition of this book, uh, Designing Zero Carbon Buildings Using Dynamic Simulation Methods, that was published by Routledge. And uh, the way how the book is structured is uh, you start uh, from, uh, from climate, from site, uh, using climate and, and local conditions. Then you go to building geometry, uh, thermal insulation, solar radiation, solar shading, thermal mass, ventilation, integration of daylight. And you integrate all this uh, to get to thermal comfort and, and achieve uh, heat balance. So pretty much uh, how building design works. And then uh, through uh, number crunching, uh, you put this into, into optimization engine. You optimize uh, different parameters there are. Um, cases where I was doing simulations of something like 930 million permutations of, uh, of a single design to come up with uh, three that are worth pursuing further and giving this as a recipe to, to the design team. And uh, as a result of that, you end up with uh, uh, renewable energy that balances uh, all these uh, um, carbon emissions uh, out uh, that arise from from this uh, scenario there, and uh, you know, problem solved. So what what what's 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 there to talk about? Except um, there is an elephant in the room. Um, I was doing a project recently where we were looking into um, helping a local authority uh, design or redesign uh, their houses that uh, had approved had uh, received. Uh, planning permission, permission to be built, not to be uh, zero carbon houses, but uh, to be built to current building regulations. We redesigned that through simulation and found that uh, if they use um, conventional materials uh, for constructing these houses, that can delay uh, reaching uh, net zero by about three decades. So. Uh, it's like uh, a Titanic iceberg, you know, you, you see it over there, but you've already hit it uh, 30 years before. So we have a problem and uh, uh, the problem is taking into account embodied emissions and doing uh, using using uh, different kinds of materials, uh, less uh, carbon intensive materials, biosourced materials, and uh, then uh, optimizing that and adding some more renewable energy or reducing the amount of embodied emissions there and uh, operational emissions there in order to achieve net zero within uh, 2050 or well before that. So this is the uh, subject of my uh, third edition of the book, which is in preparation again with Routledge and uh, um, 
I assume it will come out by 2023. And uh, that's really the update that I wanted to give you. So if anyone is interested in this, you can reach me on this address. And any questions during the uh, uh, buffet time, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Um, if I could invite two people to join me, or three people actually, Nick, Lucy and Jamie. So um, we, we just come, um, yes, <laughs> yeah, please. Um, so Lucy, as we, as we know, is the uh, Sibsi Ashray graduate of the year. Um, she works for Fairheat, um, who specialise in district heating and heat networks. So um, but by way of recognising um, your efforts and your, your, your wonderful achievements, um, on behalf of London and South East chapter, we, we'd like to um, we'd like to give you uh, two years membership. And we'd also uh, like to give you a, a hard copy of uh, Lubo's book. And um, yeah, so. I'd like to introduce you to Jamie. Um, J Jamie Lawler is from Transport for London. He's um, he's signed up. He's just about to join South Bank University. We're incredibly proud of him. And um, he, he's uh, he's our newest student member, so uh, um, we obviously present him with uh, two years membership uh, as well. So in, in recognition of that that great leap. So yeah, thank you. And just very quickly to, to finish up, if I could invite the um, Board of Governor members who are here today, just for, from the London and South East chapter, just to stand up um, where you are, just, just so people can get to know you. So, mm -hmm. as I said, in no particular order, um, we, we have uh, Luvo Jankovic, uh, our Vice President. George Blatchoff. Um, George is um, George is our student affairs uh, chair, and so uh, so yeah, brilliant. It is uh, Dimitris Tsinopoulos. Uh, uh, he's our, our, our membership uh, um, member of activity uh, chair. And Ashraf Mohammed, who's our government affairs lead. March 2018, so just uh, just a little bit over four years, and um, we spent more than two of that in lockdown. So we've been hugely constrained, but we're just to let you know we're open for business. We're hoping now to uh, to be invited back to London and South London South Bank rather um, for for more technical presentations. We hope to uh, continue to partner with Sibsi in the auspices of the um, Sibsi Ashray group. So um, so just uh, watch this space, but we'll, we'll be uh, working with our other industry organizations and partners, the Institute of Refrigeration, uh, Bisria, um, Visa. So um, please um, find us on our website. We've spent a lot of time, invested a lot of energy uh, renewing our social infrastructure, our LinkedIn, Facebook, um, we have a YouTube channel, so I'd invite you all to um, link in with us, follow us, and um, you'll find more about our, our upcoming technical program. But I think we've kept you long enough. Um, there are refreshments uh, upstairs, but I just to uh, finish off with a huge thanks to South Bank for hosting it. A huge thanks to Sibsi, um, Sibsi CEO, Sibsi President. And, and, and simply members of staff here for, for coming and supporting us. It, it, it's really, really appreciated. Uh, additionally, 
um, we've had uh, we've some members now of our Hellenic chapter, um, also in in Region 14. Uh, they've fl flown in from Greece to to support us, so that's that's immensely uh, appreciated. So thank each of you. I, I I don't know everybody here, but I look forward to meeting you outside. Uh, you've made a huge effort to be here tonight. It's I hope you've uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, and thank thank all of you very much. Hello, if I may. Yes, please. <laughs> um, you are my son, right? Which century? Yes. <laughs> and my name is Dimitri Karolambopoulos. Thank you very much. The Hellenic chapter. And I would like to make an offer. Lucy, would you like to come down to you? Right. We are going to have a conference on decarbonization in October 6th and 7th. And you are welcome. And uh, registration and accommodation will be covered by the organizing committee. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. The venue for that is in Athens, Greece. If you write us uh, decarbonization, eventually you will get to the conference site. Brilliant. I can Brilliant. give you details. You are all welcome if you want to attend. It will be interesting. I think we, we are reaching a new era of collaboration. All of us, we need this. We need our society and our societies to work together to move forward. I'm not sure how well it goes with Brexit or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's in the past now. That ship is no, out. No, no, no. We we engineers built bridges. We yeah. don't destroy them. Yeah, we built them. Absolutely. So you are most welcome. Whoever wants to come, I'll be passing a few invitations around, and it will be nice to see you. And it will be a nice idea. I would dearly love to be back out to. This university. So, if you can make a student branch here, we can find life needs excuses. <laughs> <laughs> if you give us an excuse, we'll be back. <laughs> so, please do have another student branch. And uh, these two gentlemen, uh, Artis and George, they are regional officers. And I will uh, travel along with them and will revisit you if you. Have us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Potentially now we have a we have a new student member and a new young engineer in Ashray. Yes. So you know, so hopefully we can. You have to insist that all uh, members are active in your chapter. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And, and my thanks to Region 14. My thanks to the Hellenic chapter. We're we're also hoping um, to. Uh, Organise uh, an energy and buildings conference later on this year. So just just as I said, watch this space if you if you follow us and uh, like us through the social media um, channels and professional media channels. We'll we'll keep you informed. So thank you all so much, and I look forward to having a drink with you upstairs. Thank you.